Awesome. So I'm just going to go over the goals for today's session. So we're going to be go, uh, going over an introduction to the council, including our mission and funding priorities. We're going to be going over an overview of our grant opportunities, including the timeline and eligibility requirements, an overview of application content and also staff tips. We're going to be answering the question, what happens after I submit my application? And also answering, how do I apply? Are there any resources to help me? Stay tuned. Last, we're going to be answering your questions. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so first of all, we just wanted to introduce ourselves to you. Um, so we are the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, and we are the independent state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities in the state of Rhode Island. So there are 56 uh, humanities councils that are in states and U.S. territories all over the world. Um, so we are in that cohort. And when I say we're an independent affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, that means that we're actually not a government agency. Um, we are our own nonprofit. However, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities is a federal agency, and uh, they we are receive an allocation of federal funding from them every year that you know Congress allocates and then it comes through the NEH. Um, so I mentioned that for a number of reasons, including the fact that uh, the money that we grant is of federal origin. So that's the source of a lot of the kind of parameters that you'll see in our program. Um, and just to say a little bit more about the NEH, um, it was founded in 1965 alongside the National Endowment for the Arts, the NEA, um, and Rhode Island's own Senator Claiborne Pell was instrumental in that founding, so a point of pride for us. Um, but we were established in 1973, so we're coming up on our 50th anniversary, and we're proud to be the only dedicated source of funding for the public humanities in Rhode Island. Um, and, you know, we've awarded at this point over $9 million over the last 50 years um, to more than 1,800 projects and 700 organizations. So, um, proud to support the sector and looking forward to continuing to do that. So, our funding sources, I talked about this a little bit, um, but our funding sources are, it's primarily the federal government, but then as a private nonprofit, we also take private donations and have private funding sources. So um, we apply for grants as well. <laughs> um, we're not just grant makers. We also um, get, you know, major gifts, individual donations, things like that. Um, and I also just want to mention quickly that in addition to our grant making program, you know, the other part of my title is strategic initiatives. So strategic initiatives are really the council's own projects. And um, one of those that's uh, going to be coming up soon is our civic health index, which is the first ever data driven report on Rhode Island civic health, um, and that's coming out at the end of the month, so stay tuned on that. But we have a number of other initiatives, including um, Rhode Island Expansion Arts with Rhode Island State Council on the Arts and the Rhode Island Foundation. Road Tour is another partnership, so definitely uh, check all that out on our website. But in terms of our grant making program, um, so our fiscal year follows the federal fiscal year, which is why it's a little funny. So it, it's from November to October. So we're just coming up on our next fiscal year. Um, and so for the next fiscal year, we will have a project grant program. So that's, um, you know, that's in distinction from general operating support grants, which tend to be more unrestricted funding. Our program is really for grants that support um, projects in the humanities. And um, in terms of the numbers, what we're looking at with that. Um, so our annual budget this year is gonna be $174,000. So um, that's the approximate amount of money that we'll grant over the course of this upcoming fiscal year. Um, typically about 140,000 of that goes to our major grant program and you know more like 35,000 of that or so goes to our mini grant program. Um, but that's kind of, that's in the range of, um, 
that that's around the same number of grants that we've made over the last few years every year so that can tends to translate to like 15 or so um major grants and maybe like 16 to 20 mini grants and really you know at the heart of who we are is our mission so um with which is to seed, support, and strengthen public history, cultural heritage, civic education, and community engagement by and for all Rhode Islanders. So I like to bring that up, A, because it's a great way to get to know us, but B, because it's really, I see it as a blueprint um, for our grant making program in a really profound way. So it kind of describes our philosophy, it describes what we fund, and it describes who the program's for. So you know, we see the program as seeding, supporting, and strengthening uh, the public humanities in the state. So, you know, we recognize that public humanities activities and work and practices are happening all around us all the time. And um, what we're really here to do is support and uplift and amplify and connect. Um, so that's what we're seeking to do in our program. In terms of what we fund, um, the public humanities has a big definition and an ever-changing definition, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but this is a good place to start, you know. Um, so what what we think about in terms of that, it, public history, cultural heritage, civic education, community engagement, those are all dimensions that we're really dedicated to and um, seek to support in our funding. And then finally, you know, who is our program for? Well, it's really by and for all Rhode Islanders. And that is an aspirational <laughs> statement um, that we are striving to realize at all times. But, you know, we really do um, seek to have our grant making program support the vast diversity of communities in Rhode Island across all metrics and really are always striving to um, make that more possible. So I mentioned, kind of gestured towards these definitions of, of the humanities and the public humanities. So um, in, in terms of just starting with what are the humanities? So when the NEH was created in 1965, Congress defined the humanities as a set of academic disciplines which study the human condition. So, and I think that's a, a lot of where people are used to encountering that term is in a more academic context. So that includes history, literature, languages, ethics, philosophy, religion, art history, these kind of disciplines. Um, I think it's also helpful in a more general sense to think about the humanities really as the stories and ideas that help us understand our lives and our world. So the humanities offer us the opportunity to learn from our past, to explore our present and shape the future. And we really see them as about culture, community and connections that emphasize the exchange of ideas, critical and imaginative thinking and the pursuit of wisdom. So in terms of kind of how that translates then into the public humanities. Um, so we think of the public humanities as kind of the vast array of projects and methods that really connect that humanities knowledge and those humanities practices with all members of a community. Um, and so, you know, to be more specific, that happens in public humanities projects. So all of these <laughs> things I mentioned may seem very abstract, but in practice, they're things that we encounter all our lives. So I'm talking about walking tours of a neighborhood. I'm talking about um, a museum exhibition. I'm talking about a cultural festival. Um, maybe it's an oral history. Maybe it's your favorite podcast. It's a digital, it's a website that um, allows you to encounter historic documents. Um, it could be a documentary film on a historical topic you're super interested in. So really, um, public humanities projects are vast. <laughs> we fund a lot of different kinds of things. And, and they're really um, the, the work of connecting um, communities with you know, it, not just connecting communities with, but really um, recognizing all the history and culture in communities and turning that into a public experience. And so we think that this matters because it um, creates greater connections between people, 
deeper understanding of the past and why it matters and also enhances our quality of life collectively, which is essential for civic health and for economic development, as well as a stronger democracy. And I say that as well, because in the founding NEH legislation, um, the charge was that democracy demands wisdom and vision. And so we really see the council's work as supporting that. Great, thanks, Julia. I'm going to get a bit more into the nuts and bolts of our grant making program, starting off with what we offer. Um, so you'll see these two buckets at the top, major and mini grants, as the name might imply. A major grant, um, you can request more money with a major grant than a mini grant. So starting over here on the left side of your screen, our major grant program is for requests from $2,000 to a max of $12,000. So what we're funding here in this bucket are public projects with which Julia just touched on, and also documentary film and media. Um, we're not gonna be getting too in depth into our documentary and media grants today, but just know that we do have a particular funding sequence for those grants. For more information on that, you can check out our grant guidelines. The main reason why we have this particular sequence is because we know that those projects can take multiple years and multiple rounds of fundings. So we'll be sending out the grant guidelines in the follow-up email, so stay tuned for that. So moving on down, so requests for major grants are up to $5,000 for research, planning, and development phases, and then up to $12,000 for production and implementation phases. One thing I'll note on this major grant column is that only eligible organizations can apply for major grants. And we'll talk a little bit about eligibility in just a few minutes. So for both major and our mini grants, all of our grant funded projects must be free, open, and accessible to the public. So that goes back to what Julia was just mentioning with all of our funding coming from federal funding. Since it's taxpayer money, we do want everyone to be able to enjoy whatever project you're having, whether it's an event, a walking tour, um, a film, whatever you're doing. So switching over to mini grants on the right side of your screen, it's pretty similar, but also a little bit different. Um, so mini grant requests are up to $2,000 and similar to major grants, we have public projects and documentary film and media available for eligible organizations. You'll notice that we also have a third category, which is individual researchers. So the individual research grant is the only grant opportunity that, opportunity that we offer that individuals can apply for. You might ask, what is an individual research project? So an individual research project, as the name might imply, is an individual or a group of individuals that wants to research a particular humanities topic or idea. These projects have a really wide range and can kind of encompass many different topics. Um, for some examples, it could be researching the lives of historic female pioneers from Rhode Island during a particular time period. Uh, one researcher we had wanted to re-examine Rhode Island's Gatsby affair, and we also had a project researching the history, development, and current state of hip-hop in Rhode Island. So really, the sky's the limit. Often, individuals will pursue a research grant because they're passionate about a topic but might not have the time or resources to pursue it on their own. So like our major and mini grants, all of our grant funded projects must be free, open, and accessible to the public. So for an individual research project, this means that there has to be some sort of public presentation, some sort of sharing out of the research findings at the end. This can be like a blog post, a talk, um, a podcast episode. It's really just so the public gets to enjoy um, and connect with you over your research. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, cool. So more nuts and bolts of our grant making program. So this is our major and mini grant timeline. So you'll see that some of these processes are actually happening quite soon. So for the major grant cycle timeline, this happens annually. So there's one cycle per year. This process starts on October 3rd, and that's when the letter of intent form becomes available on our grant making portal. We'll show you how to access the grant making portal in just a few minutes, so stay tuned, but that's where you're going to head to access any council grant application. So if your organization is interested in applying for a major grant, you'll need to fill out the letter of intent form by November 1st. And what we're assessing in the letter of intent form is your organization's eligibility. So after your letter of intent form is approved, 
you'll gain access to the full application. And if you'd like feedback on your application draft, you can let us know by December 1st. So what you would basically do is you'd fill out your application draft in our grant making portal. You'd click save instead of submit and then shoot us over an email saying you'd like some feedback. We'll take a look at everything, add our feedback and comments and get that back to you around December 20th or so. Your full application is due January 17th, 2023. We'll take about two months to review the applications and mid-March is when we send out decision notifications. So switching on over to our mini grant cycle timeline, it's a little bit different. So you'll see that we have quarterly deadlines. So four deadlines per year. Those quarterly deadlines are November 1st, February 1st, May 1st, and August 1st. We also offer feedback on mini grant drafts. So you do the same thing. You'd fill out your application draft in our portal. You'd hit save, shoot us over an email, and we'll add our feedback. We do ask that you give us two weeks prior to each deadline um, for feedback to be available. So if you wanted feedback on, say, a November 1st deadline, you'd have to let us know by mid-October. Mini grant decisions take about six weeks from the deadline. Uh, next slide, please. Great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, shifting into eligibility of, of who is eligible for a grant making program. So um, I'm just going to start at the top, which is what makes sense, which is that you can only have one major or mini grant open at a time. And you also must be in good standing with the council. If I will say, if you were not in good standing, you would know. <laughs> so this isn't um, something that would catch you off guard, it basically would mean that you would have had a prior grant for you that was terminated, which is something we only do in very rare situations after a lot of <laughs> things occur. But really, if you're not sure, chances are you are in good standing. Um, I will say if you have another type of grant open with the council, um, and by that I mean mostly an RI charge grant, that would not affect your eligibility for a major or mini grant. Um, and so if you're in that situation, don't worry about that. Um, but if you do have a current, if you currently have a major or mini grant open, definitely good to think about timing and check in with us if you're not sure about that. Also, our organizational applicants uh, must be nonprofits. And then beyond that, they must have federal tax exempt status, the most common type of that status is 501c3, but I've learned in this job, there are many other kinds of federal tax exempt status. So all of those are fine as well. Um, and then you also must have a unique entity identifier number. And we're gonna talk about that right after these slides. So if you don't know what that is, count yourself in good company. I didn't before six months ago, um, but that's something that you get for free from the federal government. Uh, if you're an individual researcher, just want to note that you're only eligible for research mini grants. And if you are interested in doing a, what we would consider a public project, you would need to partner with a sponsoring nonprofit. Um, and I'll mention too that we do accept fiscal sponsorship. So I mean, also if your organization does not have federal nonprofit status, but you could work with another organization that does. Um, that could work for your project. So if you have questions about that, also please get in touch. Um, Marsha, I think this comment, uh, you had a question about this. So yes, municipal and state governments, including schools and libraries um, are eligible to apply for our grant funding as well as state, local and federally recognized Indian tribal governments. Um, also, colleges and universities are eligible for programs that reach beyond the campus community. And so really, um, we would not fund a program that only impacted or had involved, you know, students, faculty, staff. We'd really want to see that um, folks off campus were involved both in the production of the project and in, as audiences for the final result. Um, and then in terms of out-of-state applicants, if you're nonprofit or you are not based in Rhode Island, that can be fine. Um, we just look for projects with a clear Rhode Island connection and impact. So a lot of times, so really, you know, the project should be by and for Rhode Islanders, 
but um, the nonprofit itself doesn't have to be incorporated in Rhode Island, say. So um, a lot of times we see this with organizations that have national that are under an, a national umbrella where the maybe the nonprofit is held by the national office, but there's a state chapter that wants to do something. Um, we also see it in projects where that are kind of large in scope, but have specific elements focused on Rhode Island, and we might just fund those elements. So for example, there was a documentary film that we funded that followed, I think, 50 different women over um, the course of America's history. And so we funded the parts of the documentary that were focusing on the two women for Rhode Island. So, um, and also just to emphasize again, all grant funded projects must be free, open and accessible to the public. Great, thanks, Julia. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about unique entity identifiers. Um, this is applicable only to organizations applying, not individuals applying. So basically it's a required number issued by the federal government for organizational applicants. The UEI number replaces the DUNS number. So formerly the federal government used something called a DUNS number. And the main purpose of this was to track how federal funds are being used. The good news is that it's a free and easy process to apply. And we do have instructions on our website for how to apply for your organization's UEI. So please go to our website for those instructions if you need them. Just so you know, it can take four or more weeks to be issued a UEI number. So we do encourage you to apply for your UEI as soon as possible, as it is a requirement for all applying organizations. You can also feel free to reach out to myself or Julia with any issues or delays. Great, so we're gonna be going over some major and mini grant selected FAQs. Julia, is there a standard timeline for a council grant funded project? Good question. Uh, the short answer is no. So the one parameter here is really that the council can't fund anything retroactively. So your pro on, your app on the application, as we'll go over in a few slides, um, you'll be asked to fill out your project start date and project end date. The project start date should start after about two months after the deadline to be safe. Um, because at that point, you will have heard about a decision notification and whatever expenses are incurred from that point forward would not have happen before you got the grant. Um, but then in terms of the end date, that's really up to you. Uh, we, you are the expert on your project. So what, however amount of time you need to do it works for us. I will say that generally given the level of funding we tend to give, um, projects that we fund don't tend to take more than a year and a half or so. But that being said, the pandemic obviously is a huge disruptive factor and we're happy to give extensions and work with folks on, you know, as their projects need more time. So know also that that's flexible as well. And if you do need more time, um, we can work with you on that. And typically it's not an issue as long as the project's still moving forward. Okay, cool, great. Do I have to write a letter for the major grant letter of intent requirement? Good question. The answer is no. So letter of intent, it can be misleading in how it sounds, but it's actually a form on our website. Uh, so if you write a letter, we will appreciate it. We will read it, but we will also ask you to fill out that form. So best to not put yourself through that. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Can I submit both a November mini grant application and a major grant letter of intent form at the November 1st deadline? Good question. So if it's for the same project, the answer is no. So I completely understand why people might want to do this. They might think, oh, I'll just hedge my bets. You know, why not apply for everything with this? We really do ask you to only, you know, pick the opportunity that's best for your project and, and yourself, or your organization, and pursue that. Um, if you do have two projects that are different and scale to the appropriate opportunity, we could consider it, we could consider both, but I will tell you that if you ended up getting the November mini grant to accept that, you'd have to withdraw your major grant letter of intent. And I know that's complicated. <laughs> if anyone has questions about that, we could circle back, but you also have to keep in mind that you can only have one major or mini grant at a time. So there would never be, there wouldn't be a universe in which if you, where you could get both. 
And we can, again, touch on that if folks are confused about what I just said. Got it. Thank you. Will the council ever offer general operating support grants again? Uh, so right now, given the funding that we have, uh, we are only offering project grants. However, if we do receive more federal emergency relief funding um, or other funding sources where that allow general operating support grants, we would we would love to consider that. Um, but with the NEH allocation that we are dispersing in our in our major mini grant program, no, that's just project grants. Okay, cool. So let's demystify this major grant letter of intent form. So like we mentioned, uh, the letter of intent form isn't a letter, but it's a form that you'll fill out in our grant making portal. And this form will be available online starting October 3rd. So the form starts off with a couple of eligibility checks. And basically this is to check that your organization um, is eligible. It starts off with checking that your organization has federal tax exempt status, like a 501c3 or another equivalent tax exempt status. We'll also ask if your organization is subject to our hiatus policy. So our hiatus policy is that if your organization has applied for and received major grant funding for four years in a row, we ask that you take a fifth year off before reapplying. We have this policy because we believe that it encourages equity and diversity in our grant making program. We also ask if you have a currently open grant with the council. Our policy again, that Julia mentioned, is that applicants can only receive one grant at a time. So if your organization does have a currently open grant, you can still fill out the letter of intent form. You'll just need to close your already open grant before submitting your major grant application on January 17th, 2023. The rest of what we're asking is relatively straightforward on the form. So we'll be asking for the name of your sponsoring organization, the name of the applicant, your project name, your estimated project start and end date, the project format, so what kind of project is it? The project phase, whether it's for development versus implementation, your estimated request from the council, as in how much money are you asking for, and then a brief project synopsis. And also just to add, none of the information on the letter of intent form is binding. Awesome. Um, so then to kind of talk about the full application, which you would um, have access to for a major grant once your letter of intent is approved. And for many grants, those are actually up right now on our portal. So you could go after this meeting and take a look, or there's also a PDF on our website. So you do actually don't even have to, if you just want to look at it, you can also just go to our website, download the PDF, not even deal with our grant making portal. But anyway, so what you can expect on that, first of all, an eligibility check, uh, because we don't want you to go through the trouble of filling this out if you are not eligible. So um, again, like Melissa said, we'll ask if you have a current grant open, um, just because we want to keep an eye on timing with that, because you need to close it before submitting your application. Um, and is your grant funded output free and open to the public? Um, we'll also ask for basic information like your UEI number, which we talked about, and your um, federal letter of determination that, you know, confirms your tax exempt status. Uh, we'll also ask about the team for the project. So that's the project director and the authorizing official. And those need to be two different people and they have two different roles on the project. So the project director is the person that I kind of think of as like the boots on the ground, the project manager, the one who's executing it, leading it, making sure that it happens. Um, the authorizing official is someone at the sponsoring organization, you know, the applying organization that really has the um, legal and fiscal authority to represent that organization. And so the authorizing official in the event of an award would be the person to receive the check, would be the person to, and would be the person responsible for making sure that all of the terms and conditions of the grant are um, adhered to. So often, you know, you can think of the, that person as anyone who could sign a check for your organization. You know, um, often it's an executive director or 
um, if you have a CFO or a board president, board treasurer, folks like that. Um, so in terms of project information, as I said, we'll ask for start and end date. Um, we'll also ask you for a synopsis, so like a two or three sentence description, kind of overall description of what you'd like to do. And we'll also ask you about your goals, outcomes, and outputs and activities. And I really recommend that you take a look at our evaluation toolkit to really get a breakdown of what we mean by all those terms. But really the goals and the outcomes are pointing to, you know, what do you want to change with this project? What do you want to achieve? Um, what specific kinds of changes do you want to see come out of it? And then the outputs and activities are really, how are you doing that? You know, and, and that's, that could be the exhibition, that could be the walking tour, whatever you want to do. We think of that as the outputs and activities. Um, we'll also ask you about humanities scholarship. We require at least one humanities scholar on each project we fund. To clarify that, um, we define that broadly. So we're not just talking about folks, you know, from academia, someone who we, you know, you, you don't have to be a professor, have a PhD, what have you, to be a humanities scholar. Um, certainly can, but we also think about people with lived experience. We think about um, culture bearers, community elders, you know, really anyone who has subject expertise that they're lending to your project. Um, and then we also ask about civic relevancy, you know, how is the project contributing to civic life in Rhode Island, as well as partners, because um, we really do see those as a very important part of public humanities work. So, you know, we'll want to know about what partners you're working with on the project, kind of what their role is, what their level of commitment is, as well as the publicity and outreach plan. So, that's important, kind of looping back to this by and for all Rhode, Islander, Rhode Islanders element. We'd like to know who you're trying to reach with this project and how you're going to do that. And then if you are planning to work with K through 12 students, um, then we'll ask you as well about the curricular alignment of your project with their the curriculum that they're working with. Um, we'll also ask about a budget since it's a grant application. So we'll ask you for your total request to the council. How much money are you asking us for? For organizational applications, we do have a cost share requirement that's one to one. So what that means is that for every dollar that you're asking for from the council, you need to match it at least at an equal amount with um, funding or support from other sources. So in other words, if you're requesting $2,000 from the council, the overall budget needs to be at least $4,000. Um, and I will say you can meet that either with cash, so you know, like money from other sources, or you can meet it with in-kind donations. So if you're donating your time, other team members are, someone's you know, donating space to you, someone's donating materials to you, you can count that. And we have no preference on the, you know, the proportion of cost or cash versus um, in kind. So if all of your cost shares in kind, that totally works for us. Um, just depends on, you know, what your resources are. So we do ask for that budget in the council's template. Um, it's an Excel template that you can download. Uh, and, you know, so we will look through that for allowable and unallowable expenses. And the best place to learn about those is in our grants guidelines. Um, I will, and because the money, you know, the funding is, is federal, um, we do have things we can and cannot fund. And I will just mention one of them, or two of them, I guess. Um, one of them is that we cannot fund the creation of art or performances in the arts. And that is, you know, goes back to what I talked about at the beginning with the distinction between the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, However, we know that many kind of arts focused projects often encompass the humanities and have very strong humanities elements. And so, you know, we can fund those kind of things. So, for example, say there's a theatrical production and then there's a talkback program after a show where, um, you know, professors and community members and journalists are invited to have uh, or, or maybe the playwright, all invited to have a conversation. We could fund that. What we couldn't fund would be like the costumes and lights and things for the show. 
Um, so, you know, and if you have questions about that, happy to talk about it. Um, we're also, because it's federal funding, we cannot fund um, actions that are, are, are projects that are calling for contributing to direct social and political action. Um, so that'd be like lobbying or like, um, yeah, telling folks how to vote, <laughs> you know, um, really what we're here to support is an informed and dynamic dialogue and information rather than the, um, than the advocacy for a particular political point of view or action. So also happy to, to talk more about that if you have questions. Um, we will also ask about your indirect cost rate. I'm not gonna go too much into that, but basically an indirect cost rate refers to whatever proportion of the budget can kind of go towards general overhead for your organization. So that could be like your copier paper or your at administrator's salary or, you know, the things that help you keep the lights on to be able to do the project. So what that cost rate is depends on if you've negotiated a rate with the government. If you have, I think you would know. You'll see that if you have questions, come to us. Um, and we'll also ask you about a project evaluation plan. Um, so that's basically, you know, what do you want to learn from the project and how will you know if you did it? Um, so, you know, that can refer to people doing surveys, um, interviews, whatever it might be. Uh, but I definitely recommend that you look at our evaluation toolkit for details on that. And there's also a video on our website uh, where I go through all of it. So definitely check that out. Um, and then finally, if you do have additional documents you want to upload, like resumes, letters of support, supplemental information, things like that, there is a spot on the application for you to do that. But all that is optional. Okay, great. So you'll notice for the mini grant for individual research application, there are many similarities to the public project application with a few notable differences. So not included as an individual researcher, you won't need to submit a UEI number. You won't need an authorized official. You won't need tax exempt status documentation. And you also won't need the one-to-one -one cost share. And we won't be asking any indirect cost rate questions. Most of these, actually all of these, are due to the fact that you're applying as yourself and not as a nonprofit or and tax exempt organization. We will be asking um, additional project information. So we'll be asking you about copyright, your research topic, research plan, research qualifications, and your bibliography. Um, so for the um, major grant documentary film and media, it's very similar application to the public project application with a few small changes or a few small additions. So we'll want to know about your project medium and runtime because uh, you're making a film or a piece of media. We'd like to hear about your aesthetic and stylistic approach. So kind of what do you think the visual elements of it are going to be? Um, we'll also need a commitment to a free public screening in Rhode Island. And again, that's because it's federal funding and we want to make sure everything is made available um, that we fund is made available to Rhode Islanders. We'll also ask for a work sample and we ask that that be 20 minutes or less. And then artistic and production staff bios so we more, know a bit more about the team. Okay, so we do have some selected FAQs uh, that I wanted to ask Melissa. Uh, so Melissa, is the major grant letter of intent form binding and do I have to submit it to submit a full application? Okay, great question. So the good news is no, the letter of intent form is not binding. The main thing that we're assessing in that form is whether or not your organization is eligible you do have to submit a letter of intent form in order to submit a major grant application. Submitting that form is the only way you get access to the full application. So our advice here is if there's a chance that your organization will want to submit a major grant application, please fill out the letter of intent form by November 1st. Um, do you give any extensions on application deadlines? We do not. Uh, so we don't offer any 
extensions really under any circumstance. Um, and that's just because we wanna treat every applicant fairly and have the same policies for every applicant. So we do ask that you submit your application as early as possible on your end. Our deadlines on the deadline day are at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the dot. So we do say like, because of internet malfunctions or personal reasons or what have you, allow for at least five to 10 minutes um, before that five o'clock deadline to submit your application. Got it, thank you. Um, and so, yeah, what if I have a currently open major or mini grant, but it's gonna be closed, you know, I'll submit my final report by the major grant full application deadline. Yeah, so that's a really great question. Uh, if your organization is in this situation, please just reach out to us so we can discuss the timing of both of your closing grant and your new application. Okay. Um, and then what if part of my project will be free and open to the public, but then another element of it will have paid tickets? Okay, great question. So this one comes up a lot. So as we mentioned, all of the council grant funded projects must be free, open, and accessible to the public. That said, you can, you can have paid tickets as another separate part of your event. So in your application to council, I would make it clear that what the council is funding are those free and open to the public elements. So like as an example, if you're having like a three day event, but the first day is free and open to the public, I would craft my application around that first day. So the timeline is about the first day of activities. That's what the project synopsis is about. The budget is asking for all of those free and open to the public activities. You can definitely have day two and day three be paid ticket events, but the council isn't gonna be funding those elements. Gotcha, okay, thank you. And then for documentary film and media, what should I know about the required work sample? Okay, great. So the main thing to know is that it is a requirement. Uh, we ask that you keep it under 20 minutes. We don't really have a preference as to how you submit that. It can be a tape, a file, a video, or a YouTube or Vimeo link. Um, you can also mail us a hard copy if that's easiest. Just note, as we mentioned, that there's some different phases for the documentary and film media grants. Take a look at our grant guidelines because the work sample requirements are different for what phase you're requesting funding for. So all that information is in our grant guidelines, but as always, just reach out if you have any questions. Cool, thank you. So let's talk about some staff tips and observations that Julie and I have thought have put together and thought might be helpful to you. Our main role is to help you put your best application forward. So our first piece of advice is to answer the questions in the application thoroughly and make sure you're following directions. Be sure any required material is included. So you'll notice in the application portal that each question has some guiding prompts to keep in mind as you're filling out your application. I would pay just special attention to those guiding prompts because they can help you keep each section on track. Do your project narrative, project budget, and timeline all tell the same story? What we mean here is whoever's reading your application should have a clear idea what you're planning to do, how you're planning to do it, and how you'll spend council funds. Uh, what I mean is like, let's say your project is a walking tour of your neighborhood. Your timeline should include when the walking tour is gonna to happen, how you'll market the tour, um, how you'll plan it. Your budget should include expenses into like whatever's involved in that, um, whether it's staffing, creating some sort of walking guide, marketing, et cetera. They should all be around the same project. Be clear about the scope of your project. What will be accomplished by the project end date? How will we know when it's done? So just make sure that you're keeping in mind, like, does this make sense with the timeline you've laid out? How does your project take inclusivity and accessibility considerations into account? So just keep in mind, how will your project be accessible to anyone who wants to participate or come to your event or learn about your work? And do you have commitments from any partners you are listing? What role will they have and can they provide a letter of support? So again, we love partnership and collaboration at the council. Uh, we just, we want you to keep in mind that any partnerships that you might be interested in exploring, reach out and make those connections early and often. 
if those folks can provide a letter of support, including their role and how they're supporting the project, that really helps reviewers get a better idea of how these partners are supporting your project. Awesome. And I'll just chime in there too to say if, if your program, if your project depends on partnerships, that's especially important. So if you're working with K through 12 students and you're anticipating working with like a school or an after school center, you know, reviewers will want to see that those connections are strong. Um, also, we'll say if you're trying to reach a particular audience, have you made concrete connections with that audience? or par partners that work with that audience. So that kind of goes along with what I was saying. And also being specific and describing your audience and how you're gonna engage with them. Also in the time of the pandemic, we wanna know, does your project provide for the safety of all team members and participants? And are there backup plans in case COVID related adjustments are necessary? You know, So if you're planning to have visiting scholars fly in from Europe, well, are you acknowledging in your application that that might not happen? And if so, what what would be the move there um, and also kind of going along with that if your project has digital elements are they current and are they feasible given it given your team's experience and resources um, and just overall start early and please be in touch with any questions um, so for our application review process we wanted to just quickly say um, once you submit every proposal is carefully considered and staff doesn't review proposals. So Melissa and I, our role is really to act as coordinators, facilitators in the process, but we are not the people making the decisions. Um, the people that are, are our board members, as well as community reviewers who are um, public humanities practitioners all across the state. And we really um, seek to have a diverse array of people participating in our process. Um, so, so yeah, so we function as facilitators, and you should know that when you're talking to us, that's our perspective. We are not the people that will ultimately be voting on your proposal. Cool, so what can you expect if you receive a grant from the council? So first of all, if you received a grant from the council, congratulations, this is such a huge milestone in your work. So congratulations, and you should definitely celebrate. And then not to like immediately shift gears, but I'm gonna talk about a little bit of required reporting. So just so you are aware, uh, we do have an interim report. If your project timeline is over a year long, basically what that is is a formal check-in on the status of your project. All grantees will have a final report that you can fill out in our grant making portal. If you get a grant from the council, um, we do have resources and can offer support for your project. So one is public. Oof publicity. We can definitely get the word out and share your project with our public humanities community. And you can also think of staff, um, again, as a resource and here to support you. And particularly during the pandemic, we're happy to work with our grantees as changes inevitably arise and adaptations will be necessary or can be necessary. Please be proactive in updating us on your plans and reaching out with any questions know that we always want to hear from you, whether it's good news or bad news or somewhere kind of in between. Awesome, thank you. And yeah, just as you're weighing your next steps, we wanted to just mention the benefits of receiving a grant from the council because we know it's, it's some work <laughs> to fill out the application. So primarily, you know, financial support, obviously um, it is a grant. Uh, so we hope that's helpful to you. Also just that grants demonstrate community investment that people outside of your team care about the project and it can be an important vote of confidence in that way. Um, also, we're happy to make connections with you know, the greater public humanities community in Rhode Island. If we know folks that are working on something similar, um, we're always happy to help build that network for you. Um, also, we've seen that um, often funding a grant from the council can help to leverage additional support and funding for the project. Um, funders are always interested to hear that other funders have supported a project and we've seen council grants be the first step for some of our past grantees in terms of getting those larger awards down the line. Um, and then finally, as Melissa said, we're happy to help promote those public facing outputs on our event calendar and our newsletter on our social media, et cetera. So we've talked a little bit about 
this grant making portal. Uh, how do you access it? How do I actually apply for a grant? So the most straightforward way to access the portal is through our website, rihumanities.org. You'll wanna click grants at the top. And then from there, you'll wanna locate this leftmost column. And right where that red circle is, you're gonna to wanna to click that link, apply for a mini or major grant. That'll take you to our grant making portal where you'll be able to either create an account if you've never logged in before or log into your existing account. Um, I'll note that this is the only way that you can submit an application to council. We don't accept any emailed or mailed copies of our application. Awesome. And then in terms of resources to help you, there are many. <laughs> so um, our website is a great place to go. As I mentioned, we have PDFs of our applications on there, as well as our grant guidelines, which is kind of the Bible for the program. Melissa and I refer to it, our evaluation toolkit. Um, which will walk you through how we think about evaluation. And then we're going to post a video of this workshop as well, so you can refer back to it, as well as the evaluation workshop video that's already um, online there. And just so you know, we're, I'm going to email you all of these resources as well, so you will really have them. Um, and then also, Melissa and I are a resource. It is literally our job to help you, so we're happy to do it. Um, please contact us well ahead of the deadline to talk through things. If you're a first time applicant or you haven't applied in the last five years, we particularly encourage you to do that. And you can reach us at grants at rihumanities.org or at the, through the main council phone number. And I'm really excited to hear from you.